My name is Todd Sanders. I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber, and we appreciate you joining us for today's webinar. The Chamber is dedicated to ensuring that the business community receives up-to-date, relevant information during this time, and it would not be possible without the help of our important partners. So I'd like to begin by thanking today's sponsors who continue to demonstrate this important commitment to our community, our chamber, and our state. So a virtual round of applause for APS, SRP, and Fenimore Craig for their strong support. Really appreciate it. Thrilled to be here today to get some important information about how businesses can prepare to get back to work while remaining aware of employer responsibilities and protections. To quickly review today's agenda, we'll hear a presentation from Melanie Pate, who is with Louis Roca, Rothger Rochristi, and then we'll have an update from Jack Howard, who's the Senior Vice President of Congressional Public Affairs with the U.S. Chamber, about what's happening at the federal level. After that, we'll take some questions, and you can submit your questions via the Q&A box on the side of your screen. We'll get through as many as we can, time permitting, but if you, want to, if you already have questions, feel free to start lining those up in the Q&A box, and I'll try and get through as many as possible. So without further ado, it's now my pleasure to turn it over to our keynote speaker today, as I mentioned, Melanie Pate. Melanie's a labor and employment partner at Louis Roca Rothgerber Christie. Melanie, thank you for joining us today. Take it away. Todd, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and, and share my uh, PowerPoint screen with everyone. So hopefully everybody can see that. All right, so good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you today. As Todd mentioned, I am a partner at uh, in the Labor and Employment Group at Lewis Roca Roth Gerber Christie here in Phoenix. And uh, I've given this presentation uh, several times to uh, several different groups. Um, and there's always a lot of questions that are generated uh, from, from the, the content. So uh, please do submit your questions as we go through the slides and then we can talk about those uh, at the end of the presentation. So I'll get going here. So um, there's a lot of content, so I wanna uh, make sure we get through all of it within the 30 minutes that we have. All right, so everybody knows that we're phasing back into work slowly but surely uh, in Arizona and everywhere else. And a lot of employers are doing that in, uh, in phases um, and they are, um, bringing people back in slowly but surely and sometimes on a purely voluntary um, level. Um, Todd, I'm having a little trouble going to the next slide. Jessica, can you forward that possibly? Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry, I got it. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. Um, so as we're doing that, as we're going back to work and we're trying to do that in a safe and effective way, um, there are some pillars of a safe and effective return to work protocol that employers wanna be looking at and uh, thinking about as you bring people back into the workplace. Um, and on this slide, I have listed the, the six main pillars uh, that we've come up with for um, this, type, this effective return to work uh, process. The first one involves employee testing and screening pro procedures, and we'll go through that in some detail. Uh, the second is employee safety precautions, what employers and businesses need to be thinking about when you bring your people back. Uh, employee leave options that will continue to be available um, I want to make sure everybody's aware of the state and federal laws that remain in effect and that your employees may be able to take advantage of. And we're also going to talk for a few minutes about staggered work schedules and how you can make that work for your company. Uh, then we'll talk about revert, the importance of revised policies and handbooks going into this uh, new phase after the pandemic. Uh, well, not after or during this kind of second phase of the pandemic as we try to return to some sort of new normal. And then we'll talk about regular and effective communication with your employees and how, and how important that is. I'm also going to talk for a minute about uh, the, the OSHA requirements and the workers' compensation uh, issues and questions that people are having right now, and also talk for just a second about a bill that the House, Arizona House passed on Friday um, that uh, was not actually passed by the Senate yesterday, but we expect will be taken up potentially later this summer, and that involves um, liability for uh, businesses. Okay, so the first issue that we wanna talk about today is employee testing and screening procedures. 
Now, the Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, the EOC have both said that COVID-related inquiries and medical exams uh, can be done, uh, but they have to be job related and consistent with business necessity. And in the days of the pandemic, they basically said all businesses can do COVID-19 uh, testing and screening and that it will be deemed job related and consistent with business necessity under the ADA. Um, so some options for effective testing and screening are um, that you can do daily tests and or screening. Uh, the, the testing must be uh, accurate and reliable, and that's according to the EEOC's guidance. It can include temperature checks, uh, daily temperature checks of your employees if you choose to do that. Uh, you can also do uh, what a lot of employers have started doing, which is symptom questionnaires. Uh, that is daily, uh, a daily questionnaire for your employees before they come into work, asking them if they have any of the symptoms that are currently listed on the CDC website of coronavirus and asking them to confirm that they do not have those symptoms or if they do, that they need to stay home and seek medical, medical care. Uh, those results must be kept confidential. It's really important for employers and businesses to keep that in mind. Uh, you should keep them confidential in the same way that you keep medical records that are related to FMLA requests and ADA requests. You should keep those in the same separate files. Uh, and if you decide to do this, um, the, this testing and or um, temperature check testing and or symptom questionnaires, you really should consult with uh, counsel and potentially a healthcare provider just to ensure that you've got um, a lawful and appropriate protocol in place going forward. Another option is um, daily or weekly symptom self-certifications where you have employees certify that they do not have a temperature over 100.4 degrees. You also have them uh, certify that they uh, have not suffered from any of the symptoms of COVID-19 during the past 24 hours. Uh, this may not screen out all of your infected employees and of course we all know that uh, somewhere around 30 to 35 percent of, of people uh, who have COVID-19 are asymptomatic and can still spread the disease. Uh, but this is a cost-effective mitigation strategy if you don't choose to do any other type of daily testing or, or symptom questionnaires. And again, if you do decide to do either online or, or written self-certifications before people come into work, you need to make sure you're keeping the results of those certifications confidential um, in the same way that you would with any other employee medical records. Um, so the question I get asked a lot is, um, are employee testing and screening procedures mandatory? They are not mandatory, but um, some sort of screening is recommended by OSHA and the CDC at this point in time. So there's no federal or state law that requires employee testing and screening and or screening. Um, you can also do uh, COVID-19 testing if you have um, the ability or you have the availability uh, to do that type of testing in your workplace. A lot of employers and businesses don't have that, that ability at this point in time because the, the testing is, is simply not that widely available, but the EEOC uh, has uh, stated that you can do COVID-19 testing on your premises if you have the logistics and ability to do that. So what are some of the pros and cons of workplace testing and screening? Well, the pros are that you can use that testing procedure as evidence that the employer has engaged in a good faith effort to protect their employees before they come back into the workplace. Um, the, some cons are that if your testing procedure is inaccurate and not reliable, it could potentially create a false sense of either security among your workforce um, or a false sense of concern. Um, uh, the quick result tests that have come out recently um, have shown to possibly have a false negative rate of up to 15%. So again, you wanna be really careful if you're gonna be actually doing COVID-19 quick result testing that you are using a, an accurate and reliable test um, uh, that, it, that would be acceptable um, under the EEOC's guidance. Um, now, what should you do if, if uh, you have an employee who tests positive for COVID-19 uh, when they, before they come back into the workplace or, or when you're doing screening? Um, you do need to inform others who work at the same office that an employee has tested positive that works in that office. You might potentially want to close down that particular office or area of your office for deep cleaning if, if that is uh, 
a possibility and if you think that's an appropriate thing to do. You definitely should not disclose the identity of the employee who has tested positive, um, but you can provide details about the employee's job duties um, and the general workspace where they worked. And you can also uh, inform people who worked closely with that person that they may have been exposed to COVID-19 and that they should self-quarantine for at least 14 days if the employee believes that they have been um, exposed. Now, the next question that people ask usually is, well, if I have somebody, an employee who tests positive, when can they come back to work? Uh, and the CDC um, actually just issued some updated guidance uh, just recently uh, that, that has the file following guidelines in it, which is pretty similar to what they've been saying all along, but this is where they're at at the moment. Uh, what they're saying is that people who have been sick with, with COVID-19 symptoms or if they um, have an infection and they've tested positive, they should stay away from other people, including work, until they've gone at least three days with no, fe no fever, and that's without using Tylenol or, or other uh, fever-reducing medication, and all of their symptoms have improved, and it has been at least 10 days since they first noticed the symptoms. So they need to, to, to be able to satisfy all three of those factors um, in order to be able to come back to work. Um, now, depending on whether their doctor says they should or whether they there's available testing, um, they might want to get tested to see if they actually have COVID-19. If they do get tested, um, excuse me, sorry about that. And if they do get tested, um, they want, you want to make sure that they're, um, they're around others only when they have no fever, their symptoms have improved, and they've received two negative tests in a row at least 24 hours apart, which may be difficult for some people to, to get two tests in a row 24 hours apart. So then you wanna rely basically on, on the first test the, on the upper part of the slide. Um, again, asymptomatic people who test positive should wait for 10 days after a positive test before they mix with other people. And of course, people who are exposed to someone um, who has COVID-19, they need to self-quarantine for at least 14 days before they come back to work. So let's talk about um, employee safety precautions and what employers should be doing while they're having people come back into the workplace. Uh, this first bullet point is probably pretty obvious, but definitely needs to be stated. You should definitely require employees who are sick whether or not they've been tested actually for COVID-19 to stay home um, and follow the guidelines for when they are uh, able to come back into the office. Um, you should allow all employees to wear masks over their noses and their mouths and also to wear gloves. Um, you should provide this PPE or uh, personal protective equipment to your employees if at all possible. You can require that PPP, PPE be worn while people are at work. Uh, you, you don't have to make it optional. You can require it if you deem it necessary for your workplace. Um, and you need to keep in mind that you could be required to provide alternative PPE um, as a form of reasonable accommodation. Um, for example, for people with disabilities or medical uh, conditions who cannot tolerate uh, having a face covering on all day long, there may need to be accommodations made for um, those employees. And you, there may also be situations where you could possibly have to make an accommodation for religious reasons. If um, someone has a religious reason why they cannot wear certain types of PPP while they're at work. Um, you also obviously need to advise your employees to avoid physical contact with others whenever you can. Uh, this includes encouraging the use of telephonic or, media, or, or, or um, video meetings whenever possible. We're all incredibly familiar with Zoom meetings and WebEx meetings these days, um, but they should continue if they can. Uh, limit the number of attendees for any in-person meetings. Um, encourage employees to keep six feet away from each other and anyone else with whom they interact, including customers, um, vendors, clients, etc. You also want to look at reconfiguring your workspace or spaces whenever you can to make sure you're maximizing social distancing among people who may be working in more of a common area and don't have separate offices that they can go to um, and be away from other people. Additional safety precautions are requiring your employees to use their own dishes, their own silverware, uh, bring their own coffee, bring their own water bottles to work, don't have common coffee machine areas or 
uh, or water uh, dispenser areas where people can congregate and use the same equipment to get water and coffee. Uh, you want to think about closing or restricting the use of your common areas, your break rooms, your conference rooms, your meeting rooms. Uh, restrict outside visitors to your workplace. And if you do have visitors come into your workplace, think about whether you want to have them complete symptom questionnaires before they come into your workplace. Um, also encourage online meetings as much as possible. Um, promoting personal hygiene is really important and um, is really as simple as posting signs throughout your workplace, encouraging people to wash their hands regularly, um, make alcohol bet alcohol-based hand sanitizer, at least 60% alcohol, make that, and cleaning supplies widely available to your staff. Um, making sure you have office supplies and, and equipment where if they're shared, you have um, alcohol-based wipes that you can use to clean them before and after the use of every employee who needs to share that particular equipment. For example, copy machines um, or scanners um, or, or other types of, of common use equipment. You also want to look at ways to improve your air, circulate, air circulation, whether that's talking to your building manager uh, or your property manager about what they're doing to, um, to improve air circulation within your work environment. And even things as simple as opening doors and windows, um, if you can, where that's possible. Um, even something as simple as, as that can, uh, can help with um, circulating and, and getting the virus uh, to, to not be as concentrated in one area. You also want to encourage employees to report any workplace health or safety concerns that they might have immediately um, because uh, there might be things that they see that, that they're worried about um, and that you, maybe you haven't thought about or, or looked at. So you want to get your employees um, input on that. All right, let's talk for a few minutes about employee leave and accommodation options. So employees um, going forward into, into returning to work um, will be potentially eligible for, for leave uh, and or uh, accommodations under a variety of laws um, or even a combination of laws, um, including the recently passed Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which hopefully all of you have heard of. It went into effect on April 1st, 2020, and it will be in effect through December 31st of this year. The FFCRA includes uh, two main provisions. One is for up to two, to, uh, two paid weeks of sick leave for um, the emergency paid sick leave provision um, for a variety of reasons uh, that must be related to COVID-19. Um, it also includes the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Act or the EFMLA, which uh, allows for up to 12 weeks of pay for um, empl or employees who need to take time off to take care of school-aged children whose schools or daycares have closed uh, or will, will remain closed due to uh, COVID-19 reasons. Uh, the EFMLA only allows for uh, up to two-thirds pay for um, employees who take that leave. Um, so you want to make sure uh, if you have employees who request leave under the FFCRA that you look at the rules and regulations, um, maybe consult with counsel or your, consult with your HR staff, make sure you're um, uh, making sure that those, those employees are actually qualified to take leave under each of these two provisions. And you also want to make sure you're aware that you are properly documenting that leave because employers, um, oh, and, and this, this law actually only applies to employers with 500 or less employees. Um, and that leave can be reimbursable through tax credits um, back from the federal government. So you could uh, actually get, allow this leave for your employees and then be fully reimbursed um, by it from the federal government through tax credits. Um, also remember that even with this new law, the old FMLA, as we call it, it, it remains in place. Um, so the expanded FMLA is just another category of the larger Family and Medical Leave Act law, which might also need to uh, be taken and, and considered as a potential leave for employees who become sick or need to take care of family members who are ill. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act remains very much in effect, um, so make sure you're talking with your employees if you need to about reasonable accommodations and considering um, whether accommodations need to be granted um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you need to be thinking about whether state paid sick laws, excuse me, state paid sick leave laws might apply. The um, Arizona Earned Paid Sick Leave 
law does remain in effect during this period of time and employees may be able to take leave under that law. Uh, workers' compensation laws could come into play and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And then also um, your employer provided sick leave and PTO benefits um, may be used in combination with um, any of uh, or some of these other types of of leave options under state and federal law. So remember when you get these requests um, for leave um, related to uh, COVID-19 illness or, or, or other reasons um, or, or people needing childcare, et cetera, you need to look at those um, quick requests and evaluate those requests on a case by case basis and make sure you're uh, engaging in the interactive process with your employees under the ADA if that is um, needed. All right, you should also be aware, I think everybody probably is at this point, um, that uh, the CDC has specific guidance regarding the high risk characteristics for uh, people who are potentially more vulnerable to serious injury or, or serious illness or death uh, due to COVID-19. And uh, those characteristics are listed on this slide. Uh, we most of us know that that involves or includes people who are age 65 or older and also people with underlying medical conditions um, all of which are listed here and um, could include a significant uh, portion of the population um, so you want to be um, making sure you're um, aware of these high-risk characteristics as people come back into the office excuse me and may want to take leave or may want to talk to you about um, accommodations based on their underlying medical conditions. Now, the EEOC has issued some guidance regarding this issue. Um, on May 7th, they issued um, some fairly detailed guidance about how employers need to, um, or what they need to consider when it comes to requests for accommodations uh, for employees who may be um, may have high risk characteristics or um, other qualifying disabilities. So if an employee doesn't request an accommodation, the employer is not required to provide one. So just make sure you're aware of that. Even if the employee may qualify for one or you might think as the employer that the person probably does qualify for one. Um, you're not required to provide one um, if they don't request it. And um, uh, along the same lines, if you know that an employee has a high risk characteristic, um, you cannot ex just generally exclude him or her from the workplace um, or take any other adverse action against them just based on that particular characteristic. So even if you know somebody has one of the high risk characteristics, you need to make sure you're being careful not to um, just exclude them um, without having some discussion with that person about their situation. Now, you can uh, under the ADA, and this is a little bit convoluted, but I want to make sure everybody's aware of this. The ADA does allow such action, um, or you can exclude um, employees with disabilities if that person's disability poses a direct threat to his or her, his or her health that cannot be eliminated with a reasonable accommodation. So that's a little bit confusing, I know, um, but that's, that's the guidance right now. And so what a direct threat means is that if the disability the person has poses a significant risk of substantial harm to that employee's own health, and you can't eliminate that risk without, with a reasonable accommodation in the workplace, then you might be able to just exclude that person from the workplace. But that's gonna be a somewhat difficult um, bar for employers to get over as, as far as proving um, all of these, proving everything that's required to, to just tell somebody they absolutely can't come to work. Um, now, it's going to be based on the employee's specific disability and their current condition, not just the disability in general. So um, even if you have someone who you think um, their disability poses a direct threat to them, to their own health, you still have to try all reasonable accommodations before you exclude that person from the workplace. Now, a potential accommodation, uh, are, these are listed at the bottom of this slide. Uh, these are just some ideas. There are all obviously other uh, accommodations that you might be able to come up with as you engage in the interactive process with employees. Um, but you could think about things like putting barriers between employees with high risk characteristics and other employees or eliminating uh, 
marginal job functions that possibly put that, them at higher risk, uh, potentially modifying their job schedule or workplace. Um, and that would include allowing em, uh, employees who are high risk or fall into high risk categories uh, to um, actually uh, continue to work at home. And that's probably the most simple accommodation uh, for someone with a high risk characteristic. If you can allow them to continue to work at home, uh, then that might be the answer um, in a lot of these types of situations. All right, so let's talk about use of staggered work schedules. Uh, a lot of employers are looking at this as an option. Um, one of the options is to give your employees the, uh, or allow them to decide to return to the work uh, to return to the office voluntarily um, and to continue teleworking for the time being. Um, if you can't do that or that's not feasible for your business, you can also look at staggering the days or the shifts during which employees return to the office. So I've got an example here, simple example, 50% of your staff works on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, 50% works on Tuesday and Thursdays, with the overall goal, of course, being to limit or lower the number of people that you have in the office at one um, at one point in time, um, so to lower your capacity to make social distancing um, that much easier for people. Um, you also want to look at whether you want to stagger the hours or periods during which your employees take lunch or take breaks or uh, potentially gather in, in various areas um, to, for, for work-related reasons, uh, making sure again that you're allowing for um, appropriate capacity to um, have social distancing be able to apply. Now, once you've looked at all of these issues, uh, you definitely want to consider whether you want to or should revise your policies or your handbooks um, to address uh, your new rules, your new safety precautions and requirements of your employees. Uh, you want to make sure that you circulate those to your employees, uh, make sure they review those and acknowledge them. And acknowledging, by acknowledging, I mean uh, have them uh, uh, just a simple uh, written acknowledgement form that they've signed and dated and keep those in the employee's personnel files so that everybody's on the same page about the ex expectations um, as you reopen um, in your various phases. Uh, the, the employees also, it's important to let them know that, that your requirements are mandatory, whatever your requirements are, and that there could be a potential disciplinary action if your employees violate your new policies um, and, and you can decide on what that disciplinary action will be or should be going forward. And you also need to talk about uh, before you put your policies in place, or even if you already have put new policies in place, consider how you're going to enforce those policies um, and consider how you're going to address situations um, where employees disagree with your policies or challenge them. Um, as we all are pretty much aware at this point, um, wearing masks has become somewhat, a somewhat divisive issue um, in, our, in our society. And there could be situations, and I've actually um, encountered a few with clients where employees have adamantly uh, refused or disagreed with um, wear, uh, mandatory face mask requirements in the workplace. All right, regular uh, communication is so important right now. Make sure every, your employees know your policies. Make sure they understand what your policies are. Um, employees who feel that their employer you know, cares about their health and is trying to create a healthy and safe environment as people return to work um, are much less likely to, to face issues with those employees um, as far as potential complaints or even lawsuits going forward. Um, or complaining to outside entities such as um, the Department of Labor, um, ADOS, uh, potentially the EEOC, et cetera. Uh, so the more you communicate with your employees, um, the better you'll be um, in most cases. Um, and so that in itself can be a, a good way to prevent liability going forward. And I just want to talk for one minute before I, um, before I finish up here about potential protection from liability for Arizona businesses. Uh, workers' compensation, uh, as most of you probably know, um, might potentially be an infected employee's exclusive remedy for potential remedies, but workers' compensation insurers will be making coverage determinations on a case-by-case -case basis, and they will be looking at whether it was more likely than not that the person who is infected and claiming a work-related injury uh, was uh, actually uh, infected or became infected because they were in the workplace. Um, you want to make sure you're aware that Arizona law does permit workers' compensation coverage of infectious diseases. 
um, as long as a relationship can be demonstrated between the illness and uh, the injured person's work duties. So that is going to be um, a, a something that uh, the that workers' comp insurers are looking at, a, uh, at on a case-by-case -case basis and making those coverage determinations. Uh, some of you might be aware that the state of California uh, recently uh, enacted a, a new order which creates a presumption that someone who has been at has gone back to work and becomes infected with COVID-19 did contract the infection at work and then and then it's the employer's burden um, to basically prove that that is, was not the case. Um, that is not the law in Arizona at this point in time um, and it remains to be seen if that is um, something that will occur in Arizona. Uh, but most people doubt that that will likely go uh, go into place in Arizona. You also need to look at whether you, if you have somebody that becomes infected while they're or after they've come back to work, you need to investigate the circumstances of their infection. Um, and, and there are some factors listed on, on the um, ADOSH and the OSHA websites about what you need to be looking at. And because you need to determine whether you have to record that illness in your OSHA 300 log as a serious injury um, or illness. And again, that's only for infected employees who actually become ill and have symptoms. Um, but I just wanna flag these issues for you so you're thinking about them if you have employees who become infected after they come back to work. And then lastly, I just wanna to touch quickly on uh, House Bill 2912. Uh, the Arizona House passed this bill on May 22nd, last Friday. It protects schools, churches, businesses, employers, et cetera, basically all entities that have employees or people or have the, the public coming and going uh, in them at any point in time. It protects them from COVID-19 liability uh, based on claims of uh, strict liability, premises liability, or negligence, except in cases of gross negligence. So these entities could be subject to claims um, under these three claims listed here uh, on the slide unless they are shown to have engaged in gross negligence. Um, and then the burden of proof for the gross negligence is clear and convincing evidence. So the, the, uh, the, the point or the purpose of this bill is to provide some protection for businesses from COVID-19 liability. So the Senate convened yesterday actually, um, and uh, people thought maybe they would vote on this bill, uh, but they did not. Uh, they did not vote on any on this bill or any other bills actually yesterday. Um, and they voted to, um, to, to come back later at some point, they voted to go out of session again, but they are expected to hold two special sessions uh, this summer sometime. Uh, to address COVID-19. There were some, some concerns that the House bill doesn't cover cities and towns, um, liability for cities and towns. So that might be addressed. And then um, some other COVID-19 budget issues are expected to be addressed as well. Um, so that's the end of my time. Todd, I will turn it back over to you. Oh, Melanie, thank you. What a, what a wealth of information. I've got like two pages of notes. So thank you so much. And I know um, we're going to have some questions coming up, and I know there just there was a question about the presentation and this um, this event. We are recording it. And we'll make the um, slides available, so so know that if you're watching. Um, and but we'll come back to you in just a in just a moment. Um, now, what I'd like to do is introduce Jack Howard, who's the senior vice president of congressional and public affairs for the U.S. Chamber. And Jack's going to share some additional insights and update updates from a policy perspective about what we can expect in the next few weeks. So with that, Jack, thank you for joining us and take it away. Make sure I mute myself. The, uh, yeah, thank you, Todd. I appreciate that invitation. And yeah, that was a very impressive uh, presentation by Melanie uh, about a lot of the practical imp implications of what we're all trying to work our way through. I know for our member companies, for the chamber of member companies, this is exactly what we're trying to um, help them navigate as well, uh, in addition to trying to help um, work with members of Congress to try to provide uh, some more um, liability uh, protections um, as, as we move, as, as frankly, as everybody moves from dealing from the immediate health crisis, uh, pumping out trillions of dollars to try to stabilize uh, businesses of all sizes, particularly small, small businesses, uh, Congress has already passed three pieces of legislation, phase one, phase two, and phase three. 
And eventually, at some point this summer, they'll get around to passing phase four, although it's interesting that um, the sense of urgency about uh, trying to deal with the immediate crisis really has faded uh, dramatically. So I'm not expecting any <clears throat> real legislative action on a phase four bill any time in the next few weeks, and quite possibly uh, well into uh, July. But in any event, um, that actually gives us some time here at the chamber uh, in terms of working with members of Congress, our member companies, um, members of the administration to assess what really worked well in the first phase, first three phases, and then try to make adjustments as, as phase four legislation is put together. In particular, the Paycheck Protection Program, which I, I'm sure a lot of your, um, a lot of the people on the call have been wrestling with. Congress is gonna to continue to make uh, adjustments to that as, as we move forward. But one of the real big debates that's shaping up uh, for the phase four uh, legislation is the whole um, liability reform debate. You probably saw Senator McConnell early on uh, a couple of weeks ago declared that there will be no phase four legislation without some significant um, liability protection provided for uh, businesses and employers. So he's really got his heels dug in. He's got the Senate Republican Conference united behind him. The House Republicans uh, are also united behind uh, some version of liability reform. And actually the White House too, we've been working with the White House. Tom Don, you had a call, I think a couple of weeks ago with <clears throat> Mark Meadows, the uh, White House Chief of Staff, just reemphasizing uh, how important it is to draw that red line in the next, uh, in the next phase four bill, um, saying basically there will be no phase four bill, no additional assistance for anybody unless uh, significant liability protection is included. And it's our view that um, as, the, as businesses, employers, the economy moves from, um, moves from just trying to help people deal with the immediate healthcare crisis and all the consequences flowing from that. And as the economy, as, as employers, employers start to move back to um, returning to work and a lot, dealing with a lot of the issues that Melanie just outlined, um, providing significant li liability protection is key to that because we wanna make sure that employers aren't afraid to reopen um, and uh, for fear of um, being subject to, to any kind of a lawsuit uh, and that there actually are jobs there for uh, employees to return to. So liability, uh, legal reform has really been a top priority for the chamber for as long as Tom Donahue, our CEO has been um, at the chamber since 1997. In fact, we have a whole division called the Institute for Legal Reform that does nothing but try to try to um, press for um, legal liability reform and also do battle, frankly, with the trial lawyers because we all know this is shaping up to be quite a titanic struggle uh, with uh, plaintiff's lawyers, a trial bar, uh, all looking to file all sorts of lawsuits and line their pockets um, with uh, lawsuits that will really undermine our economic recovery. We've got healthcare workers and other, uh, you know, frontline workers of all sides, of all kinds, working 24 hours a day uh, to get us through this pandemic. And they have to be able to help people and save lives without uh, fearing excessive lawsuits. So that's really how we're approaching uh, this, next, um, this next phase for legislation. Fortunately, we've already seen uh, as a result of some of the some of the provisions in the phase two legislation passed back in March, uh, a handful of states and uh, actually a bipartisan Congress extended liability protections for um, a narrow set of volunteer healthcare workers and certain products such as the N95 masks we all hear so much about and protecting them against uh, needless uh, lawsuits. But unfortunately, uh, the crisis is continue to be exploited and expanded for opportunistic litigation and lawsuit abuse. We see ads all over the place. They're, uh, I'm here in Maryland, they're on TV all the time. They're in Ohio, Florida, Tennessee. Uh, lawsuit marketers are soliciting firms to take advantage of cheap uh, media buys, litigation funders. Uh, those are the people who finance lawsuits in exchange for a cut of the settlements or aggressively uh, touting their services. Um, and frankly, this is a broad-based crisis uh, facing um, the, the economy as a whole. 
we have exposure related lawsuits to product liability lawsuits, shareholder class actions, all businesses will be vulnerable uh, in some way to some kind of litigation. Nobody is going to be spared from the threat of litigation. Grocery stores, restaurants, banks, furniture stores, food produ producers, farmers, manufacturers, all, all face potentially astronomical and business threatening liability risks. It'll even extend beyond just your, your more business focused entities to affect schools, churches, uh, charities, and uh, <clears throat> other nonprofit organizations. Um, companies that make COVID-19 related products are vulnerable, including medical device and equipment makers, local brewery distillery makers who are making hand sanitizers, bank makers of disinfection products, and even home-based uh, or small uh, business making uh, masks. Uh, class action security lawyers are, are already taking advantage of stock drop prices that are no real fault of the companies because of their response to COVID-19. So this is all underscored why it's so important for us to get across to members of Congress and other policymakers. It's important, the importance of limiting litigation abuse is so essential to recovering from this pandemic and getting people back to work. Business owners and employees must be able to feel safe and be able to safely provide the goods and services that allow Americans to live their lives without fear of uh, liability that could put them out of business. So what we're proposing, what we're advocating for on the Hill is really, it's, it's really, the key theme is timely, targeted, and temporary liability protections. It's not as some of the leading Senate Democrats initially just leap to the conclusion. It's, it's not broad-based blanket protections. It's timely, targeted, and temporary liability protections. And as I said before, there's actually precedent for Congress passing uh, this kind of timely targeted liability protection on a bipartisan basis, because they've already done it. They did it. In the CARES Act, as I said, it included liability protections for volunteer healthcare workers and uh, certain personal protective equipment. Back in 1999, uh, I don't know if you remember, but in the Y2K Act, uh, limited lawsuits in state and federal lawsuits over economic losses that were associated with Y2K glitches in transitioning computers from, 19, from the date 1999 to 2000. And then just recently, Congress also passed the Safety Act to guarantee liability protections for technologies uh, companies who are helping in the fight against terrorism. So this is, this is not unprecedented. Uh, it doesn't have to be bipartisan. It doesn't have to be partisan. Uh, each one of these laws uh, passed with strong bipartisan support because policymakers, members of Congress, understood the acute economic threat uh, that lawsuits posed at a mo moment of maximum economic vulnerability. And so that's where we are. Uh, we've, we've done several surveys, particularly for small businesses, that show that they are one lawsuit away from closing their doors. And that was in an era of better economic conditions. So you can see that a lot of them are just teetering on the brink here, fearful of the threat of exposure-related lawsuits that could, that could deter businesses from reopening. Even if it was determined that as a public health matter, they could safely operate by following the guidelines uh, of appropriate health authorities. So we are doing the best we can to advocate for sensible legal reform policies that strike the right balance. And as I said before, do it in a timely, targeted and temporary way. <clears throat> so for example, we are proposing targeted reforms that will give businesses a, a liability safe harbor when following a, an appropriate standard of care to protect its employees and customers from exposure to COVID-19. So the standard of care would include following CDC or other state and local guidelines to prevent exposure. <clears throat> there would be no protections, none whatsoever, for gross negligence, recklessness, or willful misconduct. Um, we are proposing medical liability protections for healthcare workers and facilities that are inspired and frankly are based largely on recent executive orders issued by Democratic governors, particularly Governor Cuomo in New York, uh, Pritzker in Illinois, and Whitmer in, in, Michi in Michigan, among others. So we've gone out of our way 
to avoid turning this into a partisan food fight and actually take a look at what some of the some of the states have done already, particularly with Democratic governors in terms of providing um, medical uh, liability protections. We also think that we have considerable public support uh, for this across the political spectrum. Not that this is not going to be a big fight in Congress. I don't want to try to minimize that. But we did a poll recently uh, <clears throat> that found that a ma vast majority of Americans across the political spectrum support appropriate liability protections. Uh, our legal, our Institute for Legal Reform um, found, did a poll that found the following. There really is no practical difference in the opinions of voters based on party affiliations. So that's a good thing. 84% support liability protections for essential businesses that are currently open during the pandemic. 82% support lawsuit protections for businesses that have been shut down but are looking to reopen. 75% support lawsuit protection for hand sanitizer companies, soap companies, and other cleaning supply companies. So we're seeing strong support, uh, not just you know, in the low 50s or mid 50s, it's really pretty, pretty overwhelming support. Uh, majorities of Republicans, Democrats, <clears throat> and independents agree with those uh, those types of li liability protection. So that's what we're, re we're really uh, focusing on in terms of engaging with, with Congress and trying to shape this next phase of, uh, of legislation, as I said, is, is phase four. Obviously, we've been working very closely with Senator Mitch McConnell. He's leading the Senate effort to try to, to, try to, um, to draft a lot of these uh, concepts and turn them into legislative language. Senator Cornyn from Texas is his is, is right-hand man on this. But we've also reached out across the aisle to Senate Democrats. And while their initial reaction was pretty negative, once they understood a little bit more about what we were trying to accomplish, the door is starting to open, at least to the point where we can have uh, civil conversations with them um, about the types of liability protections they need, which is why, from the chamber standpoint, it's so important for us to work with those, um, our member companies, our state and local chambers who are located in in a lot of those uh, um, states that Democrats um, represent in, in the House as well. We're also working with House Democrats. Uh, like I said early on, some of the leaders uh, in the House and the Senate had kind of a knee-jerk reaction that there was no way that they were going to provide any sort of legal protection, particularly for the big bad corporations like, like us, quite candidly. But if you really think about it, the, the ones who are really most affected not that the large corporations are not affected because they will be, but they have the legal resources to be able to defend themselves. It's the small, medium-sized mom and pop operations who really don't have those types of resources. So um, I think I've, I've kind of taken up most, if not a little bit more of my time. So let me stop there and then I'd be happy to try to answer any, any questions as well. Well, I thank you for that update and for the great work that you're doing the U.S. Congress, we, uh, we certainly appreciate the incredible job you've, you, you're doing over there, so thank you. Um, we obviously have some some questions as a result of the presentations, and um, maybe I'll start with, with Melanie. Um, you obviously are in contact with employers. You're talking to employers on a daily basis. Give us a sense for, um, you know, what what is the, what are, what are you hearing during these discussions with employers as they're getting back from the offices, and what are their top challenges or concerns right now? Yeah, good question. Uh, well, um, like I mentioned uh, during my presentation, uh, I have had several clients who have had uh, employees um, hear about, you know, requirements for wearing face masks or other PPE in the workplace who have, uh, you know, pushed back pretty hard and said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to exempt myself from that requirement. I'm not I refuse to wear a face mask. It's unconstitutional. You know, all of the, the, the arguments that people are putting out there for not wearing face masks are also um, being, uh, you know, argued to employers. Uh, and, 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 it's, and employers are, uh, at least some of my clients, are, have been somewhat perplexed as to how to respond um, to that pushback um, from their employees uh, when they have decided to require 
uh, face masks or any other PPE for in order for people to come back to work. And, you know, what I have advised them is that uh, they do as employers have a right to tell their employees uh, what sort of equipment they need to wear in the workplace um, in order to protect the health and safety of their workforce um, and, and whatever way that they deem necessary. Um, it's, it, it, it is uh, within their discretion to decide uh, what the rules are going to be for their workplace. Now, like I said, there does have to be um, accommodations potentially made for people who have disabilities or medical conditions or uh, who can't tolerate wearing a face mask or need breaks or whatnot. Um, but those requests do need to be supported by medical documentation and, uh, you know, there, there needs to be some support for those requests. Um, and, and I've also, there's also been um, some issues uh, with employees who have been asked to come back to work and are afraid to come back to work. Um, that's been an issue that uh, uh, several uh, clients have, have, have encountered um, when asking people to come back. And, and the, the issue with that is that, um, you know, that, that, it, that could be legitimate. Uh, for example, if someone is over age 65, or if they fall into a high risk category, um, uh, like those listed on the CDC website. And, and that's a situation where the employer does need to have a discussion with that person about their particular situation and whether there needs to be some sort of accommodation made for them. Um, but if you've got uh, someone who is not a high risk person who doesn't fall into any of those categories and doesn't have any, under, any other um, legitimate reason uh, for not wanting to come to work other than they're generally afraid um, of, of coming back into the workplace, even with all of the precautions that the employer has put in place, um, then, uh, you know, the employer does also in that situation have a right to tell that person that they may need to make a decision about their job and whether they want to continue working for the employer, um, because general fear of not coming to work is, is not um, an excuse, even in, in, in these days of a pandemic, um, if the employer has, you know, gone out of their way to, to follow the CDC guidelines, follow all the state and local guidelines, put policies in place, and prepare their workplace for their employers, their employees to come back into work. So those are a couple of the main issues that, that I've been seeing. Thank you. And I, and I know we were hearing those as well, and everyone's sort of grappling with that. There's a question from the audience. I thought was a good one. You know, whether or not it, re it relates to older employers or not. But the question was, is we know the age of our employees. Is it legal to get a written waiver from those individuals to return to work? So if somebody maybe is a high risk, um, and maybe just anybody, um, if they want to come back to the office, is it, is it something that you would recommend to get a waiver? And is that a protection? No, I, I would not recommend that you get a waiver um, for, for employees who are over age 65. You shouldn't be singling out your employees who are age 65, uh, even if you're concerned about their health. If they have a reason to be concerned and they want to talk to you about that um, and, uh, and, and be able to continue to telework or have other accommodations made, um, then, then that person should bring that to your attention. But singling people out um, who are uh, age 65 or over, or um, as the law says, age 40 or over. Uh, so uh, getting a waiver from those people uh, I don't, I don't think that that is really helpful uh, in any way, as long as you've taken precautions to uh, make your workplace safe and healthy, and you're following all the CDC guidelines and state and local guidelines uh, to the best of your ability, then it's up, it's really up to um, those employees to make their decisions for themselves. Um, and having them sign a waiver uh, of liability uh, isn't really going to protect you in the end if you have been grossly negligent in uh, keeping your workplace uh, safe. Thank you for that. Um, you talked about um, protocols for if someone tests positive. It's certainly important to think about. I think one of the concerns for employers is bringing everybody back and then having somebody test positive, having to deal with sort of making sure they're okay and going through their stuff. But then what do you do with your office? Are you, are you compelled to then put every, ask everyone to, to go home until you can make it safe again? What are, what, are the, what are the guidelines there if somebody tests positive in an office situation? You know, it really, really depends. And I know that's such a lawyer answer, but it really depends on what your workplace is like. How, how large is it? Um, are people 
you know, in, in separate offices? Are they in, in common workspaces? Um, you know, what, how is your office space configured? Do you have employees, several uh, or groups of employees who work together closely, but not so much with other groups of employees? So uh, I hate to say you need to look at it on a case by case basis, but you really do. And if you decide you've got somebody who's been sharing a with other people and they all of a sudden become sick and test positive, then it probably is a good idea to shut down at least that portion of your office where that employee has been on a regular basis and do a deep cleaning and, and uh, make sure that you, you've got that area as clean as you possibly can. And again, like I said, if people, if other coworkers have been in close contact with that person uh, in the days leading up to that person either becoming sick or testing positive, then um, it's, it's a very good idea idea to um, let those employees uh, self-quarantine for 14 days so that you potentially cut cut off that spread um, and, um, and you know and it doesn't potentially spread to other people but if you've got a really small office environment um, and and everybody works fairly close together and it's almost unavoidable uh, then you may want to close the whole office down uh, for for several days and make sure that you've got the workspace completely cleaned and disinfected and people have self quarantined and then or or work from home kind of start over in a, in a sense and then try and bring people back after you feel safe um, and everybody feels safe doing so so really a, a case by case really well, is at this point yeah well i, I know we're going to wrap up and i appreciate jack talking about liability on the congressional side you you touched on the senate bill i know the, the phoenix chamber and a lot of the business community seem to be supporting the house bill um, but can you, one of the things that, that the business community was trying to do is to make the liability drafts as broad as possible uh, so we wouldn't exclude any sector or industry. Do you think that's the right approach? Yeah, that's the direction we're trying to go. Um, and that's the direction Senator McConnell would like to take. But of course, then you run, it's a balancing act because ultimately whatever the Senate passes is going to require uh, at least seven Democrats to vote for. And so that's why I said, I said before, it's so important for us to try to thread that needle by getting enough Senate Democrats. Ideally, we'd like to get some leadership, but I, I think that's pretty unlikely. So what we're trying to do is identify, you know, particularly in, we're thinking your Senator in particular, who have, um, you know, more are all more moderate business friendly types of senators who are willing to work with us in terms of drafting that legislation. But it's really hard to draft this kind of legislation that will, that will both be broad enough, but also specific enough so that we can, we can give uh, employers some guidance in terms of what, what you know, laws and requirements they're actually supposed to follow. Thank you, Jack. M Melanie, at the state level, any uh, same, same idea? Um, as broad as possible. I know you obviously, it sounds like you really worked on these bills. Well, no, I, I haven't actually worked on the bills. I've just been keeping very much aware of these bills so that I can keep my clients, um, you know, in the loop on them. Uh, but it does, you know, it, it, it's obviously the House is wanting to take a very broad stroke with uh, with their with the House Bill 2912, um, and the Senate, the Senate President, from what I understand, indicated that um, at least yesterday she indicated that she uh, thinks there needs to be more coverage for cities and towns. Like I said earlier, um, and so that maybe it needs to be expanded somewhat rather than um, rather than you know made more narrow. So I think it remains to be seen what the Senate ultimately decides to do and how they decide they want to tinker with what the House has already passed. Okay, well, and like, more to come, as we know, uh, legislature right. is only temporarily out of session. Well, I, I, I know we're out of time. Um, Melanie, thank you so much for your time and your insights. We, I know we will make your slides available and they'll be very helpful. Uh, Jack, thanks for all the work you're doing at the congressional level. God bless. Um, and we'll certainly look forward to hearing some updates as things progress. Um, I want to, again, thank uh, our sponsors for making today's event possible, APS, SRP, and Fenimore Craig. And we will see you all soon. Thank you and stay safe. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah.